Hi, this is Damon Pistolka, host of The Faces of Business, where I talk with interesting people sharing life and business experiences to entertain, engage, build community, and provide information to help others succeed. If you're interested in learning more about one of our guests or how we are helping business owners generate wealth and build businesses they can sell or succeed at Exit Your Way, you can find more information on our website, ExitYourWay.com or by contacting me directly, Damon, at ExitYourWay.com. I hope you enjoy the show. All right, everyone. Welcome once again to the Faces of Business. I am your host, Damon Pistolka, and I am so excited today because we're going to be talking to none other than Mike Blake. If you look at the screen there, it says Mike Unblakeable. We're going to have to ask about that, but... Mike from High Score Strategies. Mike is an expert in helping people gauge risk in buying and selling companies and business risk in general. Thanks for being here today, Mike. Damon, thanks a lot. I'm going to have a lot of fun in the next 45 minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's going to be great. It's going to be great, man. So let's, we, we always like to start off, Mike, with you probably didn't come out of school thinking that you are going to be helping people quantify risk in business. So how did you get here today to doing what you're doing? So now? I'm a, yeah. So I have an interesting or, origin story. I'm a, I'm a recovering venture capitalist and investment banker. Um, I like being in venture capital, but I, I sucked at it. Um, I was good at investment banking, but I hated doing it. And, and so over time, valuation sort of presented itself as a as as a happy middle ground, and sort of the instinct part of the valuation story you talk about. Nobody, I, I didn't necessarily grow up thinking I would do what I was going to do. Well, in fact, I could have because my father ran the valuation practice for E Y North America for about twenty five years Whoa. until Carbains Oxley killed his practice overnight, um, and he had to leave the firm basically to survive. So. My and you, you, you can, you can attribute this to chest beating if you want. But my father was until he retired. He was a LeBron James of business valuation. Okay, oh, his, right. clients were, his clients were the New England Patriots. They were Parmalat. He was an expert witness on the on the stand for eight days in the wake of of Enron. Um, oh my goodness! And and. For the longest time, I didn't want to do what he did because I'd always be my dad's kid. And nobody knows about him because he didn't write books or anything like that. He had no interest in the academic part. He just yeah. liked to go out there and basically kick people's asses. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but he was no had no interest in being a teacher, that sort of thing. But I didn't want to be my dad's kid. But it was like, as what I came to understand over over the years was that being in the valuation space is the only thing that I'm reasonably good at that I can make a legal, a good legal living at doing. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, that's, Hey, you figured it out at least. And so I fell into it because my wife applied for a job on my behalf without my knowledge. I got this interview out of, no, out of nowhere, the firm in Atlanta called Adams Capital and next thing you know, two months later, I'm working for them. And I'm starting a career in the exact thing that I didn't think I'd be doing for the right, you know, with my life. But 20 years later, here I am. Yeah. So as you started out, so let's talk a little bit. You said you really like venture capital, being a venture capitalist, but you sucked at it. So what did you really like about venture capital? What I like about venture capital is it's one of the areas in finance where you're building something. Um, whereas much of corporate finance, and this is not a, a, a criticism, by the way, it's necessary for the function of our economy. Yeah. But most of corporate finance involves moving assets around. Okay. And then people taking, you know, a commission off of the work that is required to move those assets from point A to point B to point C. Um, yep. And, and I, or, being involved in transactions where the profit margin is a hundredth of a percent, right? Like in currency yeah. transactions, something like that. 
Yeah. And that's just not something that interested me. What interested me in venture capital um, was building new businesses, right? Capitalizing mm -hmm. brand new concerns. How does that, you know, how does that work? And I, I got my start in that working in um, Belarus and Ukraine of all places for about four years where I, I, I ran a privatization program over there after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And part of a big component of that was basically carrying the briefcases of venture capitalists who came over to evaluate the, the companies that we were putting through the program and in some cases investing in them. Mm -hmm. And I learned a ton about venture capital by just, just being around people talking about deals, right? Yeah. And a better education, I could not have gotten a better education about that in any school in, in, in the planet. Um, so I, I enjoyed it. Uh, and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that 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 facet of it, but at that age, I was not I was not mature enough to distinguish good opportunities from bad opportunities. That is such a that is uh, man. It's funny you say that because I think of my career. I had no idea how to do it early in my career, and now it seems like it's just we're just a just a tad bit discer more discerning. Add those ask those two or three questions that that are the ones that you didn't ask before that would just hold you in the end if you didn't. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. That's right. So much of it is about asking the right questions, right? So. Yeah. But as a you know, as a as a twenty something, you know, it, it felt great. Everybody was kissing my ring because they wanted me to be the conduit to the general partner that would write the check. So yeah. you know, I'm puffing my chest out, and I feel like I'm all that. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, I just you know, I just didn't know, I just didn't know anything about anything. Um, and everybody want I wanted to be everybody's best friend. I wanted to fund everything and that, you know, that's a great way to lose all of your money. Yeah. Yeah. You have to say no in venture capital. That's for sure. Yeah. Most of the time, right. Your job yeah. is to say no. And then you're pleasantly surprised in the time when you say, well, I'm not going to say no yet. I still probably will, but let's keep talking. Right. And then yeah, one out of a thousand turns into a yes. Yep. And you know, some of them, I always, I always, when you talk about venture capital or, or other uh, angel is a little bit smaller deals, obviously, but I, every time, and this leads right into this, and I know you're just going to roll your eyes when I start taking it. When you hear someone talking about the valuation of this unicorn company and somehow they're comparing their company in some way, shape or form to it. Uh, I, I imagine that has to, that has to kind of, I don't know, just, give you, I don't, I don't know what it does, but you know, some pause. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, but, but I, you know, there, there are so many unicorn companies that I think a lot of investors passed on that nobody thought would do anything. Right. There are people that turned down Uber. There are people yeah. that turned down Amazon. Right. So not everybody mm -hmm. was so smart. They just knew, yeah, I just knew what the right companies were, right? So you know, to me, the way I tend to approach those kinds of valuations is, I I tend to just sort of keep playing along the conversation until there's a showstopper, and maybe sometimes there's not a showstopper, right? And maybe because mm -hmm. you know, unicorns do happen, and just as though you need a skeptical eye to weed out the the. the the non-unicorns, because that's the vast majority of the universe. Mm -hmm. It's also important to keep an open mind so that when a unicorn presents itself, you can recognize it when you see it. Yeah. So if you're looking at a company today, what would be the one thing that you would be looking for that would say, no, nope, this isn't going to be anything? Um, I or think, it's going to be challenging, I should say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think... I think it's barrier to entry. Um, number one, because you know it's it's especially now with the way the patents are kind of being warped with uh, with with PTAB and, and the way that that people want to challenge patents now get sort of a second bite of the apple. Um, 
you know, you got to answer the question. Well, as soon as you start to eat somebody's lunch, right? What you start to eat Alphabet's lunch, why are they not just going to throw fifty million dollars at it internally and wipe you out, right? Yeah. Because because the 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 thesis is, of course, that well, Google's going to buy us or Alphabet's going to buy us. Like they might, but they probably won't. You know, they do a few deals a year, right? But they only do those deals because they're forced to. They only do those deals because there's something you've got that they've decided they either can't replicate from a feasibility standpoint, or it's going to take them so long to do it, they're going to miss out on a market opportunity, right? Yeah. And unless you can prove to me that you've got one of those two things, then the onus is on you to prove to me that that's not going to happen. That's a great point, you know, because I can't tell you how many people you hear that say, well, I'm going to develop and I'm going to sell it to this big company. And and it's in software, it's in hard goods, all different kinds of places. You see that. But you're yeah. right. Most of them won't do it if they can do it themselves and not have to go through that hassle or. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that, that comes from early in my career when I sort of drank too much of that Kool-Aid. And, and, you know, brought clients up and, and saw the conversations with the companies. And, you know, the, the client would say, you know, I want $5 million for this company. And, and, and the buyer would say, well, we can build it for two. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, in fact, we think we're going to build it for five and put you out of business. So why don't you sell it to us for 400000 because we kind of think you're a nice guy. Right? That, that's, that's how those conversations go. And they're not popular. Um, they don't get written about, but those conversations happen much more often than, than the big, massive exit. The big, massive exit happens because um, you've got overwhelming leverage. Yeah, overwhelming leverage. Yeah, hey, write that down. So we'll ask about that later. So, so as you're as you're coming along, you're talking about business valuation. You're working on that, and you're get into risk what really pulled you into really learning and understanding and quantifying risk in buying and selling businesses i think it's a market efficiency issue and what i mean by that is value has three levers ultimately cash flow growth and risk and everybody loves to talk about cash flow it's happy right you're generating a lot of cash that's how that's how you get on Tim Ferriss's podcast. That's how you get on Bloomberg uh, to be interviewed, right? That's how you get on CNBC. And then growth, right? It's that times 10. You're ringing the bell of the New York Stock Exchange, right? Yep. But when was the last time you saw somebody on TV talking about risk, right? Who's the hero? Who's the hero that stepped in front of the bus? When everybody in the company said, we got to go buy this company, but the, but the risk person, usually the CFO, is the person who basically ties themselves to the train track and say, if we do this deal, I'm telling you, you're killing the company, right? When 20 other people want to get that deal done because that's how bonuses happen, advisors get paid more, including myself, when deals get done, okay? There are a lot of reasons that the deal is going to get done, often with somebody else's money. Mm -hmm. Right. And 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 um, I think about those people and I've, I've worked with them enough saying, you know, those people need an ally. Those people need somebody that speaks the language of risk and 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 where people like that in the organization get shouted down is that risk is something that's historically very hard to quantify. So the poor CFO is often left with a very qualitative discussion, which is not where the CFO wants to be because the CFO is usually a numbers person, right? Yep. So you're taking a, you're, you're taking a person who speaks English and you're asking them to deliver their argument in French. And yes. That is, that is difficult, right? Yeah. Um, and, and think about, you know, but think about how many, how many bad deals would, would have been averted when somebody listened to that one guy or that one woman in the company 
that was right, right? Think about how economic history would have been rewritten had somebody, anybody listened to the people talking about the fact that the housing market itself was unstable, but it was unstable on steroids because it was so highly leveraged using instruments that even public company auditors didn't understand because they couldn't do the math. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And I, you know, I, I just, I just think people like that, people like that need an ally. People like that need a champion. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I want to say real quick, I, I apologize because I didn't see, I didn't have it flipped over to see the comments, but we got Deo giving us the strong arm. Good. Glad to see you here again, Deo. Deo Aikens guy I know well. Then we have Dean. Dean was, uh, he hit some things earlier. This is a, compared to a $6 trillion industry. This is a deal. I don't know where that, the conversation, I apologize. We weren't keeping up with it. Cause I was, I was listening to Mike and, and enthralled by it, but, oh, he had a spelling say, but anyway, he, when he was talking about buying the big companies, buying them and, and it is such great conversation, but thanks for being here, Dean. Thanks Dale for being here. When you talk about that, that is, that is really a great point because you know, that is the CFO can, intuitively feel it they may have some indicators to do it to really though be able to quantify what it is they are walking out into unknown territory for them and it's got to be very hard for to justify what they're saying and for others to even take it any way seriously because they're used to them coming to them with numbers yeah i i I think that's right and 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 that's why you know i think that that finance in general and my industry in particular in business valuation has to adopt more widely risk management and risk specification tools. And they're out there, but because they're kind of mathy, um, they're often ignored and they're very easily dismissed as well. There are Greek letters in here. And so this is just pointy headed academic stuff. Um, but you know, pointy headed academic, a lot of pointy-headed ap- academics that actually made a lot of money on that stuff. Yeah, so you might want to listen to them sometimes. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You're right because it's not simple, but it but it is applicable, and and yeah. sometimes we overlook it. Yeah. That's right, and it's you know it it's going to take you it's going to take you a little bit to work the numbers out. Okay, mm-hmm. you know Monte Carlo simulation. For me, it's not hard because I've been doing it for 15 years, right? But but for others, it 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 can be challenging. But I can tell you when I kind of when I run those simulations in real time, and I can show the visuals of of the of the outcomes that are being drawn in real time, it 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 brings a sense of wonder to the client, which in finance you don't often have the opportunity to do. But when mm-hmm. when you show that there's a way to illustrate quantitatively that you know, there's, there's a there's a five percent chance that if you do this deal, it's going to kill your company, right? And here and here's the numbers to support it, right? You know you can still do that deal if you're comfortable with a five percent risk of killing your company, go for it. And and I'm not I'm not going to tell you to take the risk or not take the risk, but at a minimum, don't go into the deal not knowing what the risk looks like. Yeah. That's malpractice. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great point because, you know, there's risk to be comfortable with, but ignoring the risk and not knowing what the risk is, is, I mean, it, it can kill you. It just can kill your business really easily if you don't, don't uh, understand it well enough. So the, Tell me about some situations where where you've gone in and something looks good on the outside, but you start digging in and and you start doing your thing and you go, oh, this is not quite as pretty as it looks like on the outside. (laughs) We just got the Carfax, maybe. (laughs) Yeah. So my favorite is actually one of my first simulation assignments where uh, a client that has been a client of mine for a long time, they're about to sell their company for uh, for nine figures. Um, but I've helped them do a number of acquisitions and, and they asked me um, to help them evaluate a potential acquisition. 
And you know, I did what I did. I, I said, here's what I think the value of the company is, and here's why, here's the narrative. And the client looked, you know, the client sort of paused and said, you know, this is great, and I'm sure you're right. But what I really care about is if I buy this thing, I don't want to have to put more than $3 million into this company in the next five years, right? Whatever the Ooh. price is, that's yeah. my appetite for potentially covering losses of the company. What is the likelihood that I'm going to have to do that? Oh, yeah. And I said, okay, well, that, that's, a, that's a concept called value at risk that is not, again, one of those things that is often relegated to pointy-headed ac ac academia. Mm -hmm. Right, but it's it's a real thing, and it involves a, a little bit of math, not a ton, a little bit of statistics. And within a couple of weeks, I could put together a model. I said, "Look, um, if my model is accurate, if it's correctly specified, there's a thirty percent chance you're going to have to put in at least that much money in the next five years or more." And the client walked away from the deal. I said, "Look." Um, the price may be right, but that's not a risk tolerance that I'm not a risk tolerance that I care about. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point that I discovered, you know, price is 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 important, but quantifying risk and specifying it is so powerful. It, it instantly made my client a much better decision maker. Mm hmm. It was that assignment all those years ago that led me to, you know, that led me to understand risk is where it's at. Risk is where you find either the underpriced opportunities or the overpriced opportunities. And, and because the world is conditioned to think about risk purely in qualitative terms, um, for those of us who can, who can think about risk in a quantitative way, that gives us a lot of information that others don't have and information is value. Yes. I'm sitting here thinking about what you just said and it is certainly we should pause and think about that a little bit. And and if and if someone's listening to this now that that is anything to do with buying and selling businesses, you just said something that was it, it was pretty, you know, it really rang a bell for me is you're looking at that company, helping your client do that. And they want to know, Hey, what's the you know chance I'm going to put 3 million in over the next X years. And you're telling them, Hey, this is, this is a chance and it's too high. They walk away from it. But you then said spotting an undervalued or overvalued company because of the quantifying the risk is a huge thing. Because if you went in and you did the same thing and you had three different companies you were going to buy you could do it. Okay. What is the, the chances that I'm going to have to invest in this company and this company and this company or the return I can get. And you just, they could be the same price. It could be looked the same on the outside and save cash flow, everything else. But the other things that you put together could, could show that one of those companies is significantly better than the other two. Yeah, that, that, that that's right. And what it, it, it made me realize again is that is that value has a limitation in terms yeah. of its informative value. It's it's important, but it's not nearly as it's not nearly as all encompassing, right? Yeah. And, and again, it goes back to there's so much focus on growth and cash flow, which are important, but because those are so heavily scrutinized, there's not there's not a lot of things new to learn there. Mm -hmm. What isn't as heavily scrutinized because many people lack the tools to do so is the risk part of the equation. Yeah. And so if wow. I've got a pair of binoculars and the other guy just has the naked eye, right? I'm going to see a lot more birds I can bag. It's really yeah. just, it's really that simple. Yeah. There's no doubt. And you're going to walk away from the ones that aren't going to be the right birds. I mean, Exa exactly. People are just exactly. shooting them in it, you know, blindly, and you're you're just shooting the ones you want. That's the thing, and so <laughs> it goes down a whole different thing. So, how widely, when you look at the, is there a certain size where you really see a size of transaction when you really see people starting to go into the rest, taking the taking the the 
plunge into it. So if, if I'm going to be buying a hundred million dollar company, is that where you go oh, at standard practice? Or if you go off a $10 million standard practice, is there really, do you see that some of these groups that are doing these transactions, it's a standard practice that they're always going to do, or is it still kind of one office because they haven't pulled, like you said, the pointy academics into there to really give them that, that background? I think it varies company to company. If if yeah. if a company has a defined strategy of making acquisitions or something strategic like that, then they're going to have processes. Especially if they're if they're working with a private equity fund, um, yeah. Because private equity funds do pay, of course, a lot of, of of attention to risk. But many of them, again, surprisingly, don't use a lot of the quantitative tools available to them. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was wondering because if it's like, is 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 it so common? You go, oh yeah, it's like it's you know whatever. But you're saying that there's still a lot of deals done that are sizable deals without it. In my experience, yes. I mean, you know, and I don't have I don't have a, yeah. a comprehensive view of every deal on the planet. Um, yeah, but, but but you know, I I do think that, but my experiences and my visibility says that that risk assessment, generally speaking, is uh, is a very qualitative approach and and there's what i call sort of a false quant approach when when people will do what's called a sensitivity analysis yeah. right and this sort of thing drives me crazy because it's such a waste of time um but you know they'll they'll, they'll do a they'll perform their own analysis and valuation of the company and they'll say well our cost of capital is is actually plus 1% or minus 1%, here's how the value of the company is impacted. Or if the terminal growth rate is plus 1%, minus 1%, here's how the value is impacted, right? And it, it, it's to give the illusion that you're accounting for risk when you're not. In most of those cases, the analyst is, is, picking, a random, is picking a random range Right, yes. which, which may as well be putting on a blindfold while shooting an arrow at an archery target fifty yards away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, because if you don't cause... know if you don't know the distribution of those potential outcomes, if you don't know what the mean truly is, if you don't know what the standard deviation is, then those those sensitivity analyses are meaningless, and they're so dangerous because many people are led into thinking they're meaningful simply because it exists and they think that they're covered right and then they make terrible decisions because again they don't know what they don't know they don't even know how to ask the questions that define whether or not the parameters of the sensitivity analysis are relevant yeah 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 because as, as you're saying uh quantitative risk is just not discussed very often in in acquisitions or, or transactions it's just not discussed very often at all it's not it's it's left to be it's left to the quant jocks working for hedge funds and for uh, option traders that sort of thing right risk is their yeah. business yes as, um, yeah so you know they discuss it but in terms of the m a world you know you just at least I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it done in a systematic, rigorous way. I'm sure it is done. Like the Fortune 500, yeah, there's nothing yeah. that I can teach them, right? They're not yeah. calling me for a good reason. They already know everything I know and more. Yeah. But the but the impact I can make is somebody that's that's at a hundred million dollar business. Yeah. Right. And they don't necessarily have those tools. They haven't been exposed to it. Um, and just simply putting that tool in front of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as you look at this and some of the clients that you've been working with, you mentioned one working with over the years, do they begin to incorporate looking at risk in normal business decisions and having you go through some of those things? Or is that really more for just in the buying and selling of business? So they start to. Uh -huh. what, what, they, what happens with what happens with those first couple of projects where I help clients with their risk profiling 
is they start to learn the language of risk. Okay. They mm -hmm. start to understand things like a standard normal distribution and a mean and a standard deviation. Okay. And a discrete versus continuous variable. They start to pick up that language and they start to say, huh, I wonder if we could do that with our sales forecasts. I wonder if we could do that with our with our supply chain risk. I wonder if we could do that as we assess whether or not we have the right amount and kind of insurance. And yeah. that's the beauty of it. These risk analyses tools, you're familiar with the term of platform technology. Mm -hmm. Risk analysis is a platform concept that yeah. once you learn, once you learn the basics, you start to your eyes open up and, and you just start to see, oh man we can apply this to every part of our business and we become, we become risk forward. Mm -hmm. And here's the dirty little secret, you know, for if, if I move my cash flow or my growth up a percentage point, um, that's one tenth the impact of decreasing my risk, that same percentage point. Explain that again. Risk, think about the value equation. Cash flow times growth in the numerator, and then risk is in the denominator. Mm -hmm. right? What happens when you decrease your risk? It has that multiplier effect? Oh yeah. I have to put the formula on a piece of paper here, so I can look at it. But yeah. you're right. That's yeah. You think about your valuation multiple, right? EBITDA yeah, yeah. over K minus G. Yeah. Right. K is your risk variable. Um, you change that a little bit and all of a sudden your multiple just explodes. Yeah. Yeah. So how many people come to you talking about that? Because if I'm sitting here today and I'm, I'm looking at doing a large transaction in the next few years, how many come to you and go, okay, let's do a risk analysis today so we can go tomorrow. We've really made a difference in that. They, 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 well, the ones that have worked with me, once they have that, they, 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 they're they recidivists. They come back again and again, okay? Yeah. The ones that don't sort of, uh, they, they found me through social media or somebody's referred them and they say, you're the risk guy, right? You're the, you're the risk wizard. And the person, I don't understand exactly how it is that you do what you do, but I want to have a conversation kind of like this. Mm -hmm. How do you think about risk? How can we make risk a a risk management, a competitive advantage for our firm. Yeah. And we'll have a conversation like this. And and some people are scared and they run and screaming and that's fine. But then other people say, yeah, you know, this this makes sense. This is a this is a concept I've had, but I haven't had the vocabulary to express it. And you've given me the vocabulary to have these conversations and make these concepts applicable in a real world business context. And then we yeah. go, and then we go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you were, if you were thinking about this ahead of time and it is, it, it's going to affect it greatly. This, this could be, and when you look at people that are investing in businesses to build them, to grow their value or people that are doing that and they're, they're nearing an exit and, uh, that risk can be huge because you look at why don't businesses sell? Well, they don't sell because, you know, customer concentration or they're going to have all these other problems that are going to, you know, in the, the, the kind of things. And that risk can be changed. And if that risk is changed, it, it drastically affects the, the market. Well, and the beauty of it, again, the other dirty little secret is risk is the easiest thing to change about your company, right? You've worked with, you know, how many companies you you worked with over the decades and they're trying to figure out how to move the needle on their sales and their mm -hmm. cash flow. And a good salesperson is really hard to find. Right? Yep. Um, and, and say, you know, it's one thing to say, I want to increase my sales growth from four to eight, four to seven percent. But you know this, I mean, companies crawl naked over broken glass, the sensitive side down trying to get that growth number because sales is is such an inexact such an inexact practice mm -hmm. right yeah. on the other hand risk take customer concentration it's not that hard to diversify customer concentration go get another customer yeah. don't tell your salespeople that 
that I'm not going to give you commission anymore for, for customers you already have, or I'm going to lower your commission. You want to make the big bonus. You got to get new customers coming in the door. Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to buy another company that's got a customer concentration issue in the same industry. I'm going to convince them they got to sell to me for less because they've got the big, scary customer concentration issue. But by buying them, now I've got two customers accounting for 80% of sales instead of one, and there's an arbitrage opportunity. Yeah. That happens all the time. Yeah, I never even thought of that. But the the risk, the change in risk, just because you put those two together like that. And, you know, it's it's very interesting. We've seen a I mean, and you you mentioned one of the things is if if when listeners here, you may you may think about this, you may scoff at this, but I'm gonna tell you one of the things I think in the, is a real opportunity for business owners right now in that are in the situation that you talked about is is doing this is combining with someone else that hey could be a could be a friendly competitor could be somebody across the country that you know because you just absolutely transformed your chances of exiting that business successfully for more money it, it just it is without a doubt you just made some things happen and and uh that's such a great point i'm just sitting here flabbergasted at that because that could help you help you immensely. So as you're going yeah. along, sorry, I yeah. didn't mean to cut you off there, but no, as go you're going, going along now, everybody's talking about AI. Yeah. Everybody's talking about AI and this and that. In, in risk, are you seeing things where it's actually helping that or is AI really still the, the, text base, not doing the calculations kind of stuff and, and helping make better decisions there? Or do you see it really starting to be able, because correct me if I'm wrong, but risk is really blending a lot of different factors together, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you're trying yep. to do. So is the AI helpful in seeing things that we wouldn't as humans or haven't really seen it been developed yet? So right now, I think AI is in such, the AI we're used to, and we got to yeah. be careful because for people like me, who's, you know, I'm not a computer programmer. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, AI showed up when chat GPT was made available, yeah. right? Yeah. I, mean, I understand chatbots, all that stuff, right? But in terms of something that I actually use, right, it's, you know, AI started that day that it was made available to me. Yeah. Uh, but we know that it's there's been some kind of it, that AI has been a thing really since the mid 1990s that just hasn't been transparent mm -hmm. to yeah. us. Yeah. Now, now AI is, is like a fire hose that's turned on full blast and nobody's holding the end. Yeah, it, that's for sure. So you tell me, right? Sometimes that fire hose is going to get pointed at the fire, yeah. right? And sometimes you're going to point at a chihuahua across the street and knock his head off. And I don't yeah. know which one it is. And 100%. I, I think yeah. I think for a lot of companies, they don't know. They don't know yeah. what that is yeah. yet. I um, was just curious if you time, had seen something where it really did anything yet. But that's over time. Yeah, I think we can do it. But I, I was just wondering because it's we, you know, the interesting thing about it doesn't forget. It can consider more variables than we can and those kind of things. But if, if your risk analysis is already doing that appropriately, it, it may not be. Uh, anything. And I was just curious because there's so much being said about it. But where I found what? AI to be helpful in, from my perspective is it does help make sure you're, it does give you another source of, of questions to ask. Mm. Right? I can yeah. tap GPT. I can, I can, I can type into chat GPT. Uh, here's the basic fact pattern of the business. Right. What questions should I be asking? Mm. And I do that three times to there are three times. And the questions that are that come up all three times are the ones I'm gonna ask. Oh the ones that are great. outliers, I tend to discard. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good that's an interesting way to use it. And that's that's very cool. That's very cool. So as you are helping businesses do this. And as you see things coming along, is, is this risk analysis becoming more common? 
Um, no, I don't think it is. Huh. Um, I'm still, I, I, you know, I still wish it were more common. But you know, uh, you, we have a collectively have a very short memory of when things go bad on us, right? I mean, how how many times do we have to lend money to Argentina before we just first sort of figure <laughs> out they always default? Yeah. Now, with all due respect to the new president, and I know nothing about him, but I guess he's sort of shaking things up, right? But but how many times in our lifetime have they defaulted? Three, four, right? Still going to happen again. Yeah. When they don't default, right? That that's the real headline. So yeah, you know, I I think that. So what my observation is that we have a ten-year pendulum. Yeah, and this is from my fifty-three years in the planet. We have, we have two years when we start to really care about risk. And, and we're emerging from that over the last two years, okay? But up until then, the prior eight years, it's punch ball time. It's party time. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's, drinking as it's all about can. growth and cash flow. And anybody who's talking about risk is, you know, why do you got to be like that, right? <laughs> why do you got to be that guy? Yeah. And, and yeah. that's when that's when the whole world is set, you know, the whole world wants a growth stock. And everybody's writing the articles that Warren Buffett has lost his touch. And he doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. And then there's a market correction. And suddenly price to book is in fashion. And Warren Buffett is back to being the Oracle of Omaha. Mm -hmm. And we're coming out of that. And it's gonna go, it's gonna go back to growth and cash flow again. And nobody's going to care about risk, right? But for me, that's great because that's where the when nobody's when nobody's looking at risk, that's when you can make money on it. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Very cool. So interesting talking to you, Mike, and and learning more about you know your take and hearing you talk about risk. I mean, just back from um, talking about your examples of looking at the company and looking at the, for helping your client where they were going to buy a company, but they didn't want to put more than $3 million in over the next few years. And you're able to say that and they walk away from it. And then we talk about, wow, that's a quite a different way to evaluate your acquisition targets or, or if your company was a good uh, sale uh, candidate right now, the, the, to really understand that risk to see if you're, if where you want to buy at is, is undervalued or overvalued. And then um, really how, if you understood risk, this is a thing that I think that hopefully people listening today really take to heart to, to understand the risk and sales projections and your supply chain and, you know, whatever else you want to think about in your business, because, understanding that and making a change to those uh the risk factors could be a huge thing for you i mean if you're if you're a company and you're making something like heart valves or you know your your risk moving your risk factor down can make a big difference over time and well you think you think boeing stock might do a little bit better if they did different risk modeling on their fuselage design and <laughs> yeah that that uh, yes Right. Yes. I mean that 737 Max. I mean, I if Boeing doesn't put a bullet in that, I don't understand why I don't understand what they're waiting for because that thing has been a disaster since the day the thing rolled off the assembly line. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. it's 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 fascinating to watch Boeing how how they are trying how they're trying to address risk. Right. Yeah. And 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 we'll we'll you know that, that story has yet to be written. But but Boeing is a Boeing is an ongoing case study that's going to launch about fifty eight different dissertations in risk assessment and management right now. Yes, I agree with you one hundred percent there, and it's it's a it's a great example of of you know high high cost to misjudging risk, yeah. and then just the the aftermath of that is, is just bog, mind boggling in, in the cost cost and, you know, downstream effects and just things you don't know, you don't know. So, so when you're thinking about risk though, I got, we're getting close to time here, but I want to ask you one last question. 
now when we talk about risk, we talk about how you're calculating risk. I and mean, we're talking about math that's been around a long time, the statistical stuff. What's new in risk that you're going, wow, this is kind of cool. I'm really, this has got me, got me kind of excited about it again. What's what I, well, let me answer it this way. What I'm thinking about in, that is new to me in terms of risk is game theory. Um, you know, business valuation assumes, generally speaking, an equilibrium between buyer and sellers, mm -hmm. having a utility function that meets up. And, and what that means in English is that, is that buyers and sellers have an equal motivation to be in the deal or not in the deal, right? which is fantastic with the sole exception that that never happens in real life. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's always a disequilibrium in leverage. And sometimes you can overcome that with deal structure. You can overcome that with superior negotiation. Right. But the, but the fact of the matter is that that equilibrium happens on average. If you average every deal, sure. But on a micro level, there's always disequilibrium. And mm -hmm. so and so I'm kind of playing around with game theory as a way of quantifying the relative leverage as a risk differential or as a function of risk differential between buyers and sellers, among other things. That is really cool. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. I could see from your perspective, I know other people might be listening, they don't understand it, but man, the just understanding some of these things, right, is got to be really exciting to you. Because if it could bring to new discoveries, new discoveries, you could help to develop uh, better solutions for your clients and, and ultimately help them build and buy more valuable businesses. You know, again, it's, again, it's new tools. And, yeah. and, um, the, the 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 exciting thing for clients is that um, the 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 market for knowledge in this area is not efficient, which means there are opportunities for arbitrage all over the place because because game theory involves fairly basic calculus like calculus two maybe a lot of people just sort of run screaming and and the easy way out is well it's just academic stuff right. I'm not, but I, you know, that academic stuff that, you know, Nash won a Nobel prize for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. That must be somewhat valid, right? So yeah. it's just a matter of trying to take that and, and again, equipping clients and not just clients. I want to equip everybody with the vocabulary to ask the right questions about risk. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Oh, so interesting, Mike. I, I've, Really appreciate you taking the time and talking about risk with us today and, and you know, just how, how risk really affects the value of business, how it affects decision making in the buying and selling of businesses and the other things you've shared today. So if someone wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to, to do that? So I'm not hard to find. Um, on my handle, it says unblankable. So you can use that as a handle to find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. I'm posting there almost every day. Nice. Um, if you want to go email, it's uh, mblake at highscorestrategies.com. So I'm not hard to find. All right, Mike. Well, thanks so much for being here. And I want to thank all the listeners today for being there and the people that were commenting, Dale and Dean and, and others. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for being here today and hang out for a minute. We'll talk after we're done here. Yeah, thanks so much. This is so, so much fun. Oh, man, good stuff.